Ben. I'm the Director of Architecture and Built Environment at the Design Council. And it's a great pleasure to be here at the Architecture Foundation on day 63 of your 100-day series. Um, Design Council held, um, uh, convened a number of our built environment experts, of which we have about 450 across the country, um, early on in April um, to talk about the COVID crisis and how we as built environment experts could come together um, and think about solutions uh, and responses to the crisis. And some interesting conversations came out of that round table, which resulted um, in us making a proposition to the Architecture Foundation to continue that conversation. Um, and this is where we are today. Um, and what we're proposing to talk about today is um, how the, the, the crisis um, is material to sort of help us build the future. Um, and joining me um, in this conversation are three of our built environment experts. Um, so who have worked with us on a number of projects um, over the years. Um, so I'd like to welcome um, Mayan Ashkenazi, um, who has worked at the intersection of anthropology, architecture and urban design uh, for over, an, um, over a decade, um, and consults on the psychosocial aspects of spatial design. Um, she's an independent uh, consultant. Um, and our current work uh, is researching and examining urban well-being as it relates to um, the integration of diverse user groups in European cities. So welcome, Ryan. Um, then I'd like to turn to um, Andrew Cameron. Um, Andrew is an engineer with a background in transport, architectural engineering, urban design. He's uh, passionate about how we can plan for low carbon movement. He's 25 years plus experience uh, contributing to master planning and regeneration projects and works with Design Council on a number of uh, design review panels um, um, over the country. And finally, we have uh, Peter Neal. Uh, Peter's a landscape architect and environmental planner with over 25 years of professional experience, independent consultant, and Peter's absolutely um, no stranger to uh, Design Council and CABE, helping us in a number of design panels, but also um, has done a lot of work with Heritage Lottery and Nesta, and uh, looking on the future of uh, parks and the value um, of parks in terms of social, economic, um, and health and wellbeing. So welcome to our distinguished panel, who are gonna help me um, in the conversation um, that we have. Um, so one of the things I asked our panel to do was uh, to consider um, a proposition, if you like, to get us started um, in the conversation. So and I've asked each of them to reflect on this um, in turn. Um, so the proposition question that I gave to them was, um, how can we encourage sustainable travel choices uh, in cities, despite the fears that we will now harbour about public transport cleanliness? Um, and before I turn it over, I was just reflecting on the panel before everybody joined us today, how in zone two and three in London, particularly, um, that wonderful quiet um, aspect that we had of no travel and uh, no, no transport outside our windows and actually being able to hear wildlife has all but dissipated um, in the last couple of weeks. So running and cycling has become a little bit more challenging. Um, so with that kind of backdrop, um, it'd be really interesting to see how the different professions of well-bees um, can uh, shed light on that proposition. Um, so if I can turn to Mayan, would you like to have a go first at answering our proposition? And I think we've got about three or four, four minutes to, to, to each one. That'd be fantastic. Thank you. Over to you, Mayan. Great. Thank you. Um, I just want to check, can everyone hear me? Yes? Great. Um, lovely. So I actually have quite a few ideas, so I'm going to try and go through them as quickly as possible. So one is the fact that we need to um, increase the enabling environment. So uh, the street space program that we have at the moment is excellent. And the more we increase capacity, the more people are going to use it. So that's that's fantastic. But we need to focus on the people that might not have thought of um, them being able to use that environment. And so we need to think about older people, we need to think about people with underlying health conditions, and we need to think about people who are much younger, so children and their carers. And for that, there are three propositions, um, benches, toilets, and ramps. So um, we need far more benches, we need people to be able to break up that journey, to be able to sit along the way so that they're not inhibited by the fact that they won't be able to sit down and rest. We need frequent toilet stops, especially for people with underlying health conditions. 
so that they're not thinking I need to get in my car because I'm going to have this worry crop up on me and we need ramps so we need people that use electric wheelchairs and we need people that use electric scooters to be able to get on and off the pavement and to be able to use the public transport and to um, move between spaces more easily the second thing is we need to increase mixed mode much more so at the so in order to create an agile space that's responsive to unpredictable things it needs to be much more complex and we need to join up people's last bit of their journeys um, especially when we're thinking about things like the 10 minute city that kind of thing so what we need is to have much more ability for let's say buses to be able to have racks for bicycles we need to be able to have the overground to be able to accept bicycles especially now that we're not all cramped in that makes more sense to be able to allow people to bring in their bikes even during rush hour so that if you have a puncture if you have some kind of problem you're not inhibited by thinking okay i better take the car because i don't know what kind of problem is going to happen so we need to reduce those inhibitions um, even the boats that can also be something that can we, we can bring into this mixed mode thinking because that will increase the complexity and therefore the agility and the resilience of our systems and the third thing is on the tubes so the upholstery where it's beloved by everyone we love the design but we need to have carriages that we can hose down and disinfect very easily and very quickly and so for that we need things like plastic seating or we need seating that 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 basically can take that very rapid um, cycle of cleaning that's, that's it. <laughs> I hope I managed the four minutes. Wow, that was really good. Um, I think I said to the panel earlier that when we were, there's, there's sort of key phrases, that I think, so mine gets the first one, hypercleanliness and we're play, we're the 12 bingo minute city. With the words. <laughs> Bing, bingo words, yes, so that's, that's a ding ding for, for two of those. <laughs> Thank you very much. Okay, um, Andrew, can I come to you next? Andrew, you're on mute. Yes. Uh, right. Um, okay. Everybody can hear me. Yeah. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. Um, three minutes, um, three thoughts, really, um, about um, getting on the bus, the tube, the train. We know this is difficult. Uh, and there are so many issues to do with public transport. Capacity and cleanliness are the big ones. Uh, and we need to put in as many measures as possible to make transit work for those who have to use it. But for many, uh, I guess, what can we do to limit the absolute need to use transit in the first place? And for some of us, there's the option to work from home more. And we may just have to do this, uh, not because of the limited capacity of public transport, but also the limitations of our workspaces in terms of floor space and lifts and all those things. So how can we take advantage of this um, and maybe tie this in with other things? And I think there's a real role for our high streets, which we know are, are struggling, um, but for them to become the new work hubs, uh, you know, the place where you go and meet people, have a coffee, but work if you can't do that at home. Uh, we keep hearing about there's not space in our schools for all the kids to go back. So why shouldn't the high street become part of the classroom, part of the school environment as well? And use the crisis to actually uh, reinvigorate our high streets with people going to work, to school, to do all those other things there. But also we need to do other things. And for too long, I think there's been this imbalance in terms of the dominance of vehicles in our public realm and there needs to be a return to a better balance for the needs of human beings uh, and those moving around by active modes and so my second point really uh, is is about cycling and i think this is the moment for uh, a cycle revolution um, we know that about uh, 38 40 percent of journeys are under two miles a distance easily cycled in 10 minutes two thirds of journeys are under five miles you know which you can cycle in 20 to 25 minutes so it seems like a no-brainer, you know, bikes, e-bikes, tandems, rickshaws, scooters, skateboards, roller blades, take your pick. Uh, and, you know, what it delivers, of course, health, happiness, a lower carbon footprint, it solves so many issues. So I need to think, uh, I think we all need to think about road space reallocation uh, and really looking at cycling as being such a, a key way to get around. And even if you're not, you know, fully physically fit, e-bikes, everything, you know, allow you to do that. But we need, you know, safe, uh, segregated facilities, which we know, you know, people will work when we look at the increase in cycling in London. So we can do the carrot, but maybe we also need some, some stick with that. And of course, we've got the congestion charge in London. Maybe we need that in other places. But maybe, maybe we need to try things out. You know, I'd love to see in London uh, for zone one and two car free Fridays. You're not allowed to drive your car on a Friday uh, and everyone get on a bike instead and just see what happens to the streets, see what people do and how they make the most of it and finally it is i think um, about that investment in public realm uh, making changes testing and trying things out 
I've seen in so many places now, uh, you know, the emergency measures going in, the red and white filled uh, plastic barriers uh, to give us more road space, uh, sorry, less road space, more pedestrian space, more cycle space. But of course, these can come out as quickly as they went in. And we know in parts of Paris and London now, we're back to pre-COVID traffic levels. So should we make these changes more permanent? Can we use elegant planters like they've done in Dublin, recuperate parking bays for the good, for sitting out and do away uh, with those metal boxes being parked there for 96% of their time? And how can we do it in style? You know, how would they widen the footways in Monaco, in Cannes, in Vatican City? Uh, let's think about, you know, towns looking good. You need to set yourselves apart. So maybe give the plastic barriers a time limit, uh, one month maximum, and then upgrade to planters or widen the footway permanently. Reclaim parking spaces with armchairs and dining tables. Slow traffic uh, to make room for kids on scooters, make people smile. Uh, and maybe think about taking traffic out, banning lorries, experiment. Again, uh, one day a week, start small, but try things out. And finally, perhaps have some fun. Maybe we all need that. Um, I worked in Mississippi in 2005 in the aftermath of Hurricane Katrina. And there were so many grand plans for change, few of which have been uh, materialized, mainly due to the Mississippi Department of Transport. But when we asked the residents what they wanted most in one small town, it was to restore the park to its former beauty so they could have one lovely place to visit, to sit and have fun with their families. So maybe we need to do small things first, do easy things, do them quickly, do them well, but let's have a plan for the big things and start these two uh, and make some fun out of it. We will go back to the office a little perhaps, but let the new work hub in the high street perhaps help save the high street and make a walk or cycle there a journey that makes you smile. Thank you. Thank you, Andrew. Loads of fantastic ideas there. You, you didn't say uh, tactical urbanism. <laughs> it was implied. <laughs> <laughs> um, brilliant. Thank you. Lots of food for thought there. Um, Peter, can I ask you to have your turn? It's uh, uh, my turn now. Great. I can't remember the words I was supposed to say, Sue, so I will say tactical urbanism now twice, <laughs> tactical urbanism, so I get at least two points. Now I will move on to something more substantive. Um, really useful contributions for mine and Andrew. Um, and I think in many ways, where we have the opportunity now is actually to just to accelerate some of the great thinking that has been emerging over the last 20 years on active travel and sustainable travel, green travel uh, programs. And so it is a rapid evolution as much as a revolution. Andrew talks about um, a cycling revolution. I would say a green travel re revolution is within our grasp in many ways, so long as we seek to unite different urban design challenges at the same time. So this issue about encouraging sustainable travel choices in cities, and particularly with the challenges of social distancing and the difficulties of capacity on public transit, you know, we are looking at much more pedestrian and cyclist, uh, cycling orientated travel and movement. And we're looking at that very much at a local level. Um, and I see the opportunity really to unite from my particular professional interest on in environmental planning and, and urban parks is to drive a much stronger green network uh, across uh, our urban centers. And so I think some of the solution that we have here is really about a city greening and a city uh, connecting um, process uh, because we know that people will use streets and they will uh, walk and cycle more if it is attractive and safe to do. I look back uh, briefly before we start today at the RIBA City Health Check, really great, great piece of research, uh, how design can save lives and money. That was done in 2013, so that's a RIBA a City Health Check. But that showed a clear correlation between the least healthy local authority as in cities and the amount of green space, and particularly green space and housing in those areas. It also observed that streets and parks designed to be safer and more attractive were the most common changes people reported would encourage them to walk more. And that indicated a 23% increase. That increase is gonna be accelerated through the constraints of public transit that we have now. And so I see this green travel movement as an opportunity to start uniting 
uh, a, a much more systems orientated uh, approach to thinking, particularly for uh, urban green space and green infrastructure, so that those two can be united or integrated. You see, for example, TFL's healthy streets indicators. They're all about, uh, in many ways, the quality uh, of, of that street environment. Um, it is about ease of movement, accessibility, but also issues about shade, air quality, uh, to be able to feel safe. And I think you know, design plays a key part of that, but a greening environment also is essential. But if you have a framework that you can move through, you've also got an ecological network and a system that can deliver a broad range of environmental services as well. And you can start uniting up not only neighborhoods, but green spaces and green corridors. And so I see this opportunity really as to accelerate that network planning. And I'll finish with two observations. Copenhagen with their uh, cycle superhighway network, already about 167 kilometers long, and they're seeking to almost double that within the next three years. And if you go to Copenhagen, you can see great green routes connecting parks and green spaces together for local travel. And if you go to Atlanta and you have a look at the Beltline there, which I had the benefit of doing three years ago, the city centre, which was totally car orientated, now has a public transit, walkable, cyclable, roller baitable, pram pushable, unified belt, the Beltline that connects something like 45, 46 different neighborhoods together, but in a walkable public transit network that unites a whole range of uh, land uses, uh, neighborhoods and activities. So I think this is a opportunity to accelerate our green network and strategic planning approaches to our city centers. Thank you. Thank you, Peter, that's, that's brilliant. I think, What's really interesting from the three of your conversations is that we have, you know, practical granular um, opportunities and possibilities going to sort of much wider scale strategic aspects and people at the centre, the granularity of, of neighbourhoods um, and understanding how those neighbourhoods work um, and then up to the kind of big vision strategic stuff. And I, and I really like the the stuff that Andrew was talking about in terms of trialing and testing things out and, and I think this is something that I just wanted to kind of push all three of you a little bit on. We know as professionals that there's been amazing ideas and we know the evidence is there and anybody that's worked in act, active travel in the green infrastructure world this is the sort of things we've been saying for an awfully long time and I think uh, the Covid crisis has certainly brought a lens with crystal clarity on uh, disproportionate uh, you know, deficiencies and um, hardships in certain communities that don't have access to good active travel, good green space. Um, and we know the financial and economic benefits of access to good public realm and green space. So my question back is, is if, if we know, uh, particularly with cycling and a cycle revolution, these interventions are quite low cost in comparison to uh, building very large, big infrastructure, sort of roads and highways. So there's cost benefits here. Um, it's economically uh, easy and quick to do. We know the evidence is there. So, so, so why, why aren't we doing it? Why, why, aren't, why are there so many barriers to, to, to this taking place? Um, and maybe there's a question to all three of you. Um, Andrew, I'll, I'll pick on you first, um, because you're talking about um, you know the opportunities of testing or you know maybe design competitions or having days where we can see things do you think it's just because there's um a lack of joined up professions not working collectively together do you think it's um local authorities not not uh, being brave enough to make that leap um local politicians you know what is it why why do we have these barriers to what seemingly obvious <laughs> solutions <laughs> i think that there, there are so many barriers and, and and sometimes it's that we're not brave enough and, and perhaps local politicians aren't brave enough and, and i'll just give give one example um which uh, is is very close to, to to where i've you know been involved in a project for the last couple of years and it's the town of barnstable down in devon 
and I've been working on a, a town centre master plan there. And one of the ideas, there's this wonderful historic bridge into the town called Long Bridge, Medieval Bridge, uh, with incredibly narrow footways that takes 18,000 vehicles a day. And I said, well, what if we close this to traffic? And, and I said, well, you know, not permanently, this is before COVID. And I suggested maybe closing it for the Christmas market. You know, why don't we put the Christmas market on the bridge? You can see the river, which is fantastic. Uh, and, and of course, everyone said that's a lovely idea, but you know, where will the traffic go? It just, it, it's impossible to do. And so anyway, when the, the COVID crisis kicked in, um, a very nice call from Devon saying, uh, Devon County Council, uh, we're thinking of closing the bridge, Long Bridge, to traffic and making it pedestrian and cycle only and, and some buses. And I said, brilliant, you know, this is the great you know, opportunity to try it out. Uh, and we actually got the support of the leader of the council, um, uh, who she said, this is brilliant, you know, if we don't try that now, we'll never do it. But it's been met with uh, a tidal wave of opposition from uh, other politicians, uh, uh, petitions from the, um, the local businesses, local residents, who don't seem to um, recognise that it can just be a trial and don't seem to realise that, you know, life could exist without a car um, or having to take, you know, the other bridge into the, the, the town. There's two bridges, so it's fine, you know, not impossible. Uh, and I think they're still going ahead with it. They're going to do it. And I think that's bravery of leadership from the leader of the council to say, well, if we don't try it now, we'll never try it. Uh, and if it doesn't work after a month or three months, we can open it. You know, that's cheap because we're putting in barriers and everything else. But actually, if it does work, um, uh, you know, then we've got this incredible, you know, uh, entrance to our, our town centre and an incredible piece of public realm that we could use differently. Uh, and so I think we need that leadership. Um, we need people to realise that this is, again, once in a, whether it's a generation, a millennium, a century time. Uh, and if we don't try and make that shift, uh, it's so hard to do at other times. Uh, and it's wonderful, you know, when you look at people who've closed bridges, Hammersmith Bridge in London being the classic example. And of course, all the traffic modelling showed that when it was shut, London would grind to a standstill and it would be the end of civilization. Uh, and of course, they close it to vehicles and it works perfectly well. The same with Bank Junction. And there's a great paper written many uh, years ago now about disappearing traffic. Uh, and it's funny how we don't like sitting in traffic jams. And if we reduce capacity at a bridge or a junction, then we find other ways to get around. And some of that is shifting people onto other modes, which aren't necessarily about driving in a car. So anyway, that's, Thank you. that's my story of Barnstable, which hopefully... Thank you. <laughs> some, some, ...some way, a way forward. So, Mayan, what, what do you think in terms of our, our, our leadership and our bravery and um, how, how do we get rid of some of those barriers so that we can beautify and uh, make more practical um, opportunities and solutions for people in the neighbourhoods? Yeah, great. Um, and I think that's a really beautiful question because it really ties in issues of our um, social cultural environments and kind of what we think is possible down to the very physical aspects of what we actually do and how we change our environment. Um, I think part of the reason that we haven't acted in that way up until now is because there's a whole series of ideologies of individualism which we believe to be true and that sets our assumptions about people and their motivations. Um, and so that's touching upon Andrew's point that that you're going to come up against lots of different political ideologies that that assume that not to be the case and that people don't um want to act more altruistically um in reality now we're starting to shift that ideology right so we're starting to realize that people actually as much as um, they have selfish impulses people value themselves by their connections and care for other people just as much um, and that needs to be brought in far more into policy um, so that's at both a social level and at a spatial level so actually um if we look at any kind of crisis, so whether that's an acute crisis, such as something like an earthquake or a kind of a health crisis, there's often a shift from the, um, from the figure or the positive space of the buildings to the negative space or the ground, so the space between buildings, meaning all our shared resources between us. And we've noticed that just as much in COVID now, the fact that we're hyper aware of the spaces in which we collect and the spaces that we move and the space in which we meet each other. And even in an earthquake and something far more immediate, it's these spaces in which they become the center of our resources to redistribute things in order to care for people, in order to reach out. So this negative space and this design of the, of the ground um, is super, super important. And that is the basis of any kind of good urbanism. So, it, so 
three practical examples of that. Um, we need to allow for greater flexibility with local responses and touching upon um, Andrew and Peter's points, we need that to be much more iterative and to allow for that kind of local response making to happen in a much more agile way. So in Japan, for example, they have these roads which are earmarked as the catfish roads and these are the roads which when an earthquake happens, um, they can quickly be um, uh, used as a kind of these emergency highways. Um, and that just forms part of people's mental maps of the cities. They know, okay, these are the roads which have parallel modes. They have the crisis mode and they have the day-to-day -day mode. Um, in, um, in Chile, in Concepcion, a completely different context. Again, they've started to design the spaces between the buildings so that if there is an earthquake, there are certain spaces that work better for people to come together and informally start to share resources. And that creates the neighborhoods, um, it creates far more resilient neighborhoods to be able to use these kind of local solution making. And that includes things like creating much more sociable spaces, even outside of crisis times. And in New York, for example, um, they, thought they have such an ideology of the car there, right? That is the kind of uh, the heart of that sort of individualized ideology. And so what they did in New York was um, in order to pedestrianize and to beautify Times Square and Broadway, they said, okay, initially this is just gonna be a trial run. We're just gonna test this out. And so they made it much more pedestrian friendly. They blocked the cars. And actually, as soon as people saw that change was possible, as soon as people saw that it was so nice, people don't want to go back. So there's part of this, um, reluctance for change um, and there are all kinds of subtle ways to overcome that psychological inhibition to um, allow change to happen and then people change their minds right so we know that from kind of health research too if you with let's say the smoking ban first you change the landscape of what's possible and then people think oh yeah that was really crazy thing that i went into a bar and that was and i was sacrificing my health or i was working there and sacrificing my health right but the opinions change after the physical interventions often happen. So that needs to be in conversation. We need that to be iterative. Um, yeah. Thank you. So I think there's um, obviously there's individual, local and collective uh, people. There's that flex and acceptance. Um, Peter, um, yeah, if I come to you, Peter, I think leaving you to last because I know that you've had experience of where you wanted to make sort of changes in neighborhoods. I'm thinking of the, uh, the park improvement district stuff in Camden, for example, and how, um, you know, change is tangible, change is, you know, possible. Um, and yet we know that sometimes change is not possible. And I think, um, so it'd be good to sort of have your take from that but also about you know how, how we can as a profession come together and is it about the professions is it about the public sector is it about the combination of private and public is it as I've experienced when I was doing some work for <coughs> design camps actually before I joined them in Grenfell where you have people have occupied spaces and taken ownership and appropriated spaces on their own. So that kind of, you know, the, the, the individual actually saying, actually, I'm going to just take this space over and I'm going to do what I like about it. And I'm also minded of the, um, you know, before COVID, you know, obviously Waterloo Bridge was taken over by the uh, climate crisis uh, community. And, you know, that was, that was beautiful. <laughs> um, so, Peter, what's your take on kind of barriers and why we can't? Why can't we do it? Why can't we? Um, well, I think sometimes it's just lack of confidence and lack of, um, uh, I think, points of points of reference. But I, I would like to say, you know, one key issue is about uh, supporting the local economy, and that's incredibly important now, and will be increasingly important. And the emphasis on that local economy, you know, pedestrians spend money, cars don't. And I think if you look at the interface between, you know, healthy, active streets and particularly pedestrian oriented streets and what that does for the local economy is incredibly insignificant and incredibly important at this point of time. And I think that's a very big lever uh, to elicit change. We can look back at, you know, no doubt mine, but everybody's great hero of Jan Gell and his incremental pedestrianisation of Copenhagen. And that was driven partly about removing parking space, but opening up that cafe culture and increasing covers for cafes so that the economy locally was beginning to flourish. And I think you need to, to demonstrate that economic driver in this strategy, which is incredibly important. 
I think you need um, impetus as well. And I had the benefit in the late 80s of being in San Francisco, short while after Loma Peretta earthquake, which shook most of the uh, elevated freeways around the city. And so all traffic systems were closed down. I'm referencing another example that Andy has already talked about in terms of suddenly taking away that ability for car oriented to transit is not a crisis, there's an opportunity. And certainly in San Francisco with the Embarcadero and a whole range of public realm spaces were totally enlivened through a complete reconfiguring of that public realm for um, uh, pedestrian benefit principally and makes a much more civilized, much more connected, much more joined up city center. In that example, you can move from the heart of the city to the waterfront without getting um, hit by uh, six lanes of uh, freeway uh, or, or um, a whole load of gantries. You know, it makes places connect better. And so I think you have to argue this case economically, socially and environmentally. And I think the uh, opportunities, particularly on social inclusion, social dynamics uh, are also Im important. We have so many different policy issues social issues at play at this point of time and it's a matter of trying to harness them to demonstrate the changes that you want to elicit particularly in this case in terms of improving um, uh, movement and uh, pedestrian transit around around uh, city centers and making public transit much more uh, healthy and, and uh, usable i think you have to argue across all of those uh, different areas and not just frame the argument that it is about better movement around uh, the city center you have to demonstrate all those other issues i could illustrate that again back to the belt line but um we may pick that up again as we talk further but those are my observations sue thank you for that peter um i'm going to open up questions to the floor if we have them um, so Rosie, I believe, is going to sort of feed me some questions. And I think, Rosie, what we could do is, is ask individuals that are in attendance to um, ask their questions if you unmute them. Um, whilst I'm waiting for that to happen, um, to see if I get a prompt from Rosie. Yeah, we're gonna, I, was, I was just going to jump in, yeah. Um, we have okay. a question from Ellie Thomas. Um, okay, Ellie. And I will unmute you now. Okay, Ellie, go for it. Um, so if you want to direct your question either to all the panel or to individuals, that'd be great. And to please say who you are. <laughs> okay, yeah, hello, um, Ellie. So also at the Design Council, but um, hello everyone. Um, and um, I think I was thinking about this with what Maya was saying, so maybe you have a sort of answer, but, but others might as well. And I was just thinking about when we talk about sustainable transport we often talk about this idea of a sort of a, a major life change is the best chance that you have to get someone to change the way they behave because psychologically it, it means that someone is able to um, think about a, a different way of you know conceptualize a different way of acting or behaving so we often talk about sort of moving house but I think this is just really extraordinary because absolutely everyone has been forced to to fundamentally change the way that we live so it almost seems like there's a bit of a window of opportunity for those quite fundamental behavioral changes but i also imagine that there is a limit to that and that will stop at a certain point so how do we how do we kind of not miss the boat and how do we capture that and maybe how long do we have as well mayan do you want to pick that up yeah thanks um that's a really great question um yeah, and um, I think, again, what that touches upon is actually the way our, our kind of social psychology works um, and shapes our environment, right? The interaction between our kind of our social modes of being and actually the environment that we make for ourselves. Um, I think with any kind of major life change, whether that's to do with on a city scale or whether that's to do with the individual scale, um, yeah, there's a huge amount of personal change that can happen at every moment and um but that needs to then be cemented with something so there are there are two aspects to any kind of major bit of change so one is having this kind of major moment of revelation and major moment of of noticing that change is possible and the other one is actually setting up a structure that can sustain you in order to move to a different um 
mode of being the different channels in your brain to take root as opposed to falling back elastically to the ones you had before. Um, and that's as true about our, our neural circuits as it is about cities, right? So I think one of the really, really nice um, things to see in London at the moment is the street space program. Um, and it is one of these things which I think was able to happen because there was this uh, rapid moment of change. Um, but it is one of the things that will cement those, that sort of change in the longer term so that even when that initial feeling that change is possible is gone, you'll still have the evidence that, that is still in existence. Um, and that's super important. And I think finding a way to um, both to create those moments of change and to concretize them is really important, which is why I think that parallel mode system that exists in, in Japan is really, really interesting, right? So people are constantly aware that a moment of change are just around the corner. They always come by surprise. But when they do come, there's a way to capture that and for everyone to benefit from it. And that's this really important play we can work with our subconscious and our conscious and the way we work um, with space. Thank you, Maya. Does Andrew and Peter, have you got something to add to Ellie's question? Peter? Andrew? Uh, I'll chip in. Andy, you go ahead. You're slightly quicker on the draw than I. <laughs> Again, I think it comes back to, um, I think you're right, Ellie, seizing the opportunity and, and trying things out. And uh, I thought what was interesting for me, um, observing, you know, the lockdown here, um, I did see a lot of more people cycling, you know, outside our, our front door. We, we live on a main road into the centre of town. Uh, and bizarrely, I saw more people at the supermarket who'd ridden a bike there. The racks were almost full. Uh, and, and I wondered whether there was a couple of things at play here. Clearly, people had decided, you know, they wanted to get a bit of exercise. Um, but also, um, I thought, bizarrely, the fact you couldn't, or you didn't want to spend cash at the supermarket, and then they raised the um, contactless limit to £45. I think £45 is about the right amount of shopping you can carry on a bicycle as well. And so I think, you know, there was some sort of thing at play here of bizarrely people not wanting to hand over 30, 20 pound notes that use cashless and you carry it, you know, you carry it with two bags on your handlebars or on a basket or what have you. Uh, and, um, and I just don't know whether, you know, it's how we get people to carry on doing those things. Um, and particularly the cycling thing, you know, when we consider the figure I've always had in my mind is seven out of eight people in this country know how to ride a bike. Um, uh, you know, we all, you know, most of us learn as a child, um, some of us carry on, uh, but, you know, as we all know, once you get back on a bike, it's just like riding a bike and it's dead easy. Uh, and so I think, you know, those are the things we really need to um, try and encourage. Uh, and as I said before, maybe it is that Car Free Friday, uh, you know, or, or making it, you know, something that everyone does one day a week uh, and cars are banned, then it just feels perfectly normal and people start to realise this is fun and you do it with the kids and everything else. Uh, and we start to instigate that, that change. Uh, and I think, you know, the points made uh, by Maya are really interesting about how, you know, we always think this is, is wrong and, you know, everyone objects to it, but as soon as we experience it, um, you know, we suddenly realise there are huge benefits. Thank you. Peter, did you have something to add? Uh, just, just briefly, a couple of observations. I mean, the, the cycling change i've had the benefit of going through uh, regent's park uh, quite a few times during lockdown i mean it is phenomenal on the outer circle it is like the tour de, tour de france when when you're down there particularly uh, I've, done, I've done that early in the morning seven eight in the morning it is just full of cyclists going around i mean that is it's 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 remarkable that transition between car to cycle and and uh, that can happen overnight i think in terms of a response to, to to ellie's points it's sort of capturing those short-term quick changes but also ensuring that there is a long-term strategic uh, approach as well and I think that some of those short-term elements are just about making our local neighborhoods better I mean you know during the, this lockdown crisis we have stress tested our neighborhoods and our own houses and our own families I think um, almost to the limit and we know which bits now work and which don't and certainly within my neighborhood there are bits that are excellent and have really responded in terms of the quality of the urban environment to allowing people to move around and still being pleasant to be and the local parks are particularly important but there are bits of the high street that are just terrible and i think you know the ability for us through design and um, to 
reconfigure partly through that change of um, uh, transit and, and, and uh, moving to pedestrian and cycling more as Andy described but also to beautify some of those key places that are going to be used much more by pedestrians uh, and looking at, at what you can do in the short term and I think you know we have to be mindful that we've been locked down during the spring and the summer and uh, we have to look seasonally at this as well because you know if we were locked down and hopefully we won't in, in November and December all of the the patterns of movement and, and, and the use of our neighborhoods would, would change but I think we need to look at some short-term uh, activities to really underpin those changes but also strategically through planning and through development frameworks understand how you can reconfigure for the long term as well and unite that across as I said previously economic environmental and social objectives thank you Peter I think I think what's interesting I think is the um, people power it seems to me that the numbers I and mean, it reminds me of there's uh, there's an image um uh, in the netherlands when in you know because we must remind ourselves that you know cycling wasn't always thus in the netherlands you know there were mass protests in the 60s and 70s uh, to get rid of cars and that there is there is certain compelling argument i think when you see a, a, a mass of cycling that that begins to sort of change uh, behavior and the, what I'm coming to there is um, Better Bankside, which is one of the built in um, business improvement districts, um, an SE1 in Southwark, um, have started doing a bike train, um, which, you know, for those of us who've just recently pulled their bikes out of the sheds and dusted them down and gone, oh, yeah, as Andrew says, yes, I can still get on a bike and I'm not going to fall off. Um, but then to be completely befuddled by the uh, super highways, which are sometimes counterintuitive, and you find yourself maybe actually going up the wrong way. <laughs> the bike train is a fantastic initiative to um, you know, help take those newbies um, in group cycling around. And certainly sort of small scale interventions like you know, vouchers you know, or free bikes, or um, you know, let's actually make it really, really simple and easy for people to get hold of the bike and storage for bikes um, would, would really be uh, helpful, I think. Um, Rosie, do we have any more questions on the floor? Yes, we've got one from Kirsty. Uh, okay. I'll meet you. I've got all my staff asking questions. <laughs> Kirsty, go ahead. <laughs> Kirsty, I can't seem to unmute you. Could you unmute yourself? Can you hear me now? Yep. yep. Okay. Um, yeah, one of the questions I had, which is maybe more for Peter, um, is um, is one of the barriers to change a lack of methods to measure the environmental and social benefits uh, rather than only the economic or the kind of transport capacity? Peter, okay? I, I, I think I've been I've been banging on about the economic benefits, so I better, <laughs> I better start off uh, answering this one. Um, I think we're much more um, sophisticated in the way we can model now uh, environmental performance, and certainly a lot of work on uh, green infrastructure and understanding uh, the full range of ecosystem services and how you can quantify the benefits. Uh, in terms of social social value as well as financial value and those are across those full range of services uh, that are supporting that are um, provisioning regulating and cultural regulating for example about water management about uh, air quality uh, noise attenuation and I think we can start putting figures to that and start to actually demonstrate much more in the round what the broad range of social economic and environmental benefits uh, can accrue from these investments uh, and as you look at the uh, green book uh, appraisal system that is now much more uh, em embracing uh, those uh, ecosystem service indicators uh, and so I think we have to push push harder on this and to justify across that triple bottom line what these these benefits uh, offer because I think uh, in addition to supporting the local economy which is you know fundamental and increasingly so we can really recoup uh, massive uh, uh, environmental and social benefit particularly the health uh, returns particularly environmental quality we've talked a lot about uh, air quality just recently with the reduction in uh, car uh, transit um, 
and to be able to properly quantify that and measure that in terms of uh, investment modeling, I think is a real strength that we now have and one that we should make uh, much more use of. Thanks, Peter. Uh, Maya, do you have something to add to that? I'm, I'm mindful of the, the conversation yeah. that we need to have about social value um, as, as well. Yeah. And I know obviously that the uh, UK Green Building Council um, have set up um, quite a good steering group at the moment to sort of look at social value being captured um, in aspects around green built environment um, buildings as well as the sort of natural form. But what's your take on the, how we quantify it? Yeah, great. Um, so I think my perspective on that sort of evidencing of things is um, from a public health perspective. So I, I guess I'm, that's my lens at the moment. I'm with the London School of Hygiene and Tropical Medicine. So if we think about any kind of public health intervention, right, then of course we quantify it economically, but you and, and the kind of with the health benefits, but you also need to look at those kind of upstream things. And I touching upon Peter's point that it's both about the short term and the long term, you need to think about that also with the way that we collect evidence, right? So um, you have the short term ways we have of collecting evidence, but then the longer term effects are super significant. And they're often harder to measure. And actually, we need to push back slightly against that desire that quantification is the only way for us to measure things. And there's also the qualitative aspects right so if it's a qualitative problem we need qualitative solutions and we need qualitative evidence um, and lots of those things about social benefit and long-term economic benefit and health benefit and environmental benefit are things which we will notice in the much longer term um, and they are um, things which and we do more upstream interventions will have a far greater effect and that's why we need to focus so much of our efforts actually at the scale of the kind of the city level, right? Because those are the kind of interventions that when we make will have such a global impact on a whole population. Um, and we need to find lots more ways of measuring that and to think beyond just the kind of the numbers aspect um, to expanding all the different ways that actually we do do research. Thank you, Mayan. Andrew, do you have something to add to that? Yeah, just briefly, I think um, you know, many times we're in this world of, of cost benefit analysis um, and particularly in, in highway engineering, you know, we like to measure things that we can count, uh, which is sort of part of the problem of traffic engineering. So we count cars, we can count accidents, we can count journey, uh, vehicle journey miles traveled. Uh, and then, you know, to put a scheme in, um, you know, it has to generate a certain ratio of cost benefit. Uh, and yet, um, as Peter says, this is getting better, but it's still, uh, not as good as it should be and, and we end up um, you know with things uh, the right thing not being done because it doesn't show enough benefit uh, because we're not perhaps measuring or giving enough weight to you know health and happiness well-being all those other things um, which people you know uh, should uh, you know put at the top of the list um, and it's interesting to see uh, I think there was an announcement in New Zealand uh, at the end of last year before COVID saying they're starting to Reevaluate, um, you know, how they measure the success of the country. It was always about GDP and debt, and now they're starting to focus that around health and well-being, which I think is a really important message uh, about, you know, what sort of society we want to live in, uh, and then if we're going to invest in infrastructure, what are the results we want it to bring um, to the wider population? Thank you. I think, um, yes, I think the, 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 the actually quantifying and social value um, is incredibly important. And so there's some interesting work going on with the UK Green uh, Buildings Council at the moment, involving a number of quite interesting partners looking at that. I think we have natural capital counting and we have an, an other different sort of uh, drivers and ways of measuring. Um, I'm still interested, I guess, in terms of how we bring together multidisciplinaries as well. So Maya's talked about research and we know we, there's lots of fantastic research going on. We uh, Design Council, we're part of a medical research council project at the moment, which is looking at sort of place-based interventions to demonstrate how interventions can prevent non-communicable diseases. So, um, you know, asthma, type two diabetes, um, depression, et cetera, et cetera. And that, premise of that project will be to develop some interventions and test them so we're working with a number of academic institutions to do that with a, with a, with a handful of practitioners 
And the first thing we had to do is learn the new language. You know, how do you actually speak to each other <laughs> in terms of uh, academic research uh, precepts and sort of concepts and understandings to practitioners' conversations? So I think one of the things I'm always interested in is how we bring together um, you know, multidisciplinary teams um, and to call it out and to make sure that we're, we are trying to sort of do the best that we can through our professions. So, and it brings me back to that um, testing and trialing, I guess. So we know that this interesting stuff that the, that the Crown Estate are doing in central London, the, their parklets and sort of things that demonstrate to, uh, and that was obviously pre-COVID, uh, where they recognised that actually having those small green space interventions in Victoria, for example, um, in London, were, were helping the local economic uh, um, retail units. Grosvenor, you know, ditto doing some quite interesting things. Manchester's quite interesting at the moment. Lots of infrastructure going in in terms of cycling um, and a big push in the West Midlands for a new national park. Are we, are we, are we hopeful? Are we, are we optimistic about how we can all come together um, as professions and actually you know, leave things in a bit of a better way are we, as we move forward into the new reality of COVID? Peter, maybe you want to pick up on that. Yeah, I mean, a lot of this is really about joined up thinking, which we all talked about for a long period of time. And a lot of projects do achieve that. Um, but we can do much better. And, I, you know, we do have more sophisticated tools at uh, our, our fingertips these days. Certainly the spatial data and the ability to bring disparate uh, data sets, uh, public health, uh, environmental uh, conditions, economic development, uh, bringing all of that through a GIS system so that you can actually understand the pattern of place and the dynamics of place through different disciplines, public health disciplines, urban design disciplines, transport disciplines, and seeing where that interface works spatially, because you know that's a particular focus for us in this conversation today, I think is really powerful because you can bring a whole set of different people with their own interests together and layer that to draw uh, uh, combined solutions and I think they have to be solutions that are driven by equity as well so I think this underlying issue of inequalities is incredibly potent and incredibly serious and has uh, become very evident uh, through a number of different factors over the last three months if not uh, uh, over the last uh, decade of austerity and so as we map we also have to map inequality and so as we're looking and we're talking about networks and movement here, that there is the ability for better joined up benefit across communities. And I think we really need to understand how not only investment is, is drawing together those different disciplines, but it is part of that much more equitable and much more balanced approach uh, to design and development and I'll illustrate and I'll come back to this once more and encourage people to go and have a look at the Beltline uh, site uh, at Atlanta on the web because that is uniting poor and rich neighborhoods together through a network a walkable cyclable and public transit network but they are measuring investment that comes from a various public and private sources to check uh, on a two-year cycle, I think it is, it's a regular cycle anyway, that that economic regeneration is bringing dividends and benefits to all those different communities. And so it is, it is balanced. And we do need, I think, to make sure that as we uh, promote these, these initiatives, that we are also measuring uh, a fair distribution of the benefits that come from it to go beyond just understanding the benefits, but being clear who benefits and making sure that, that is a fair and balanced uh, uh, approach. Thank you. I think um, we're, we're coming to the end now, so I'm going to try and draw this to a conclusion. So but what would be great from the speakers is um, just our final thing to leave you with, you know, are, are you feeling optimistic? Um, are you feeling that we uh, can make a, 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 a better positive difference that this is this is the moment um, and I guess what what is an individual action that um, you feel comfortable or uh, empowered to sort of do to sort of help make that difference Maya if I could ask you first uh, 
Great. <laughs> Challenging question to end on. Um, I do feel hopeful um, and I do feel optimistic. And I guess part of that is, um, yeah, to do with, with some excellent panel. And I think I wholeheartedly agree with Peter and Andrew's points. And I think what's really nice is that it displays how dis interdisciplinarity can work, right? We all come from um, different backgrounds and different disciplines and we're able to talk about the same thing and to be able to work out solutions with lots of different kinds of ideas. Um, and part of that is based on new tools, right? So to pick up on Peter's points, we've got, we've got a whole set of new tools in order to visualize things, in order to connect with people. Um, and that will drive lots of different kinds of thinking. Um, a personal action <laughs> is that, um, I guess for me, a lot of it is about constantly picking up these boundary words, right? So working out the words um, and the communications through which different ideas can be understood by lots of different people. And it's constantly this act of interrogating how you communicate with people and how you um, how you're able to join things up and that and that comes down to this point of equity right constantly being aware of your position and its relationship with others and thinking through that other people's experiences might be very different to the way you experience the world thank you that's brilliant thank you andrew if you just leave us with a few thoughts sure um many years ago i i got called a corrupted highways engineer which probably explains a little bit about what I do, but also implies that I, I am an optimist and, and always have been. And, and, and we've got to keep, um, we've got to keep pushing. Uh, we've got to keep trying these things out, whether they're permanent schemes or temporary ones, I think that's really important. Uh, and spreading the word, I think is really important. The Barnstable scheme is, is one example. Um, also been looking in uh, Farnham in Surrey. Um, they've put COVID measures in there, widen the footways out with barriers but already we've talked to them about replacing those with planters talking to shopkeepers who tell us that you know if you take away the parking bays you know we'll go bust uh, yet we know from you know some of the research from tfl in outer london 40 percent more is spent by pedestrians than car drivers and they take up a lot less space uh, and sure enough they're all doing quite well so i think it's trying to you know spread that good news good examples of places so people understand what can be achieved trying it out and trying to back it up with some uh, some hard data and information uh, is how we're going to um, you know uh, slowly you know, change for, for the better uh, and it's not an easy job um, Peter like myself we've been at this for far too long now but we really enjoy it and I think we're all quite passionate about you know creating good quality towns cities great quality public realm and getting people moving around by those low carbon modes so uh, I'm sure it'll keep us busy for a while yet. Thank you, Andrew. So, Peter, I was going to come to you, but we've got one minute left. So, <laughs> don't, don't worry. <laughs> okay, you can keep going. <laughs> no, I won't overrun. But um, I think it's just, it is really, um, I'm very optimistic because I think actually, in many ways, some of the challenges that we are facing at the moment are just adding a greater emphasis on a lot of issues that we have been grappling with and exploring and seeing some great cities around the world demonstrating how to resolve these challenges um, uh, uh, that, we, that we're now facing. Uh, and so there are a lot of solutions there and you can look across uh, the cities that we've mentioned, you can look to Sydney, you can look to Melbourne, you can look to New York, Atlanta, etc. Uh, as well as uh, within our own towns and cities, that there are solutions to reconfigure the way we move around our, uh, our neighbourhoods in a much more healthy, productive and uh, economically beneficial way. Um, I, so, I, so I take a lot of heart from what we've seek, uh, been seeking to achieve uh, in terms of urban design uh, over the last 20 years and that that can be accelerated so long as we look at uniting a whole range of different disciplines and I think that's part in our professional challenge, uh, and if we leave a, a, a challenge here, is to bring in to our work other disciplines or other activities or other policy drivers that we didn't plan to do, but we want to challenge how we can deliver a range of much more joined up uh, design uh, going forwards bringing uh, other disciplines uh, with us. So I, I think we should look to draw together um, different organizations, different individuals, build new partnerships, 
to deliver what we've been seeking to achieve for quite some time. Thank you all so very much for a fantastic, um, rich conversation. Um, I think my kind of challenge and my takeaway from this is, is to echo what Peter said, but also to echo what all of you have said about communication. And I think we all need to think about how we communicate this stuff. Um, I always remind myself um, from kind of teaching qualification I did many, many years ago, you know, has learning taken place? <laughs> And sometimes you forget that, you know, we, we are sort of sometimes talking to, you know, the audiences that know this, live it, breathe it, understand it. Um, and I guess we all have a responsibility to sort of you know, take that communication out and sort of share it with people that might not actually understand it or might know it or might not be. We, um, we're, the, we're not familiar with their disciplines either. Um, and certainly in terms of integration and what, what the COVID stuff has taught us about um, bringing everybody with us in the conversations uh, is, is just as important. And a personal thing for me, I guess, is um, loving my neighbourhood a lot more <laughs> and actually, you know, noticing it a lot more and recognising the people in it a lot more um, and wanting to sort of look after its economic value as well as its uh, natural environment. Um, so I want to carry on doing that, um, whatever happens. Um, Thank you so much for uh, joining me in this conversation today. Um, and thank you everybody that's listened in. Um, and thank you Rosie for helping to facilitate it and uh, everybody in my team for putting this forward as a, as a great idea. So thank you very much.